So let me start by, uh, by thanking those who invited me, uh, especially for the music. Uh, I want to thank uh, my predecessor, Colonel, uh, the Colonel who uh, laid the foundation for what I wanted to say and laid it far better than I could say it. And I want to associate myself with his remarks. Uh, and I just want to point out that uh, the people who are running our policy toward the Middle East are really strong on rhetoric, but not so strong on good sense. Um, it's really nice, for example, to have uh, alliteration. Uh, we're, remember what was going to happen to the Taliban? We were going to be degrading, dismantling, and destroying the Taliban. That was 2009. Now we're going to be degrading, for some, some reason, not dismantling, but ultimately, what? Destroying Al Qaeda and uh, ISIL and so forth like that. Well, you know, how are we going to do that? Well, the, the Colonel had some good, sensible observations, uh, but when you hear uh, very, very insane comments like, well, we're not really worried about uh, ISIL getting very close to, to, uh, uh, to the airport there. Um, or taking over Anbar province in the West, um, the only reason we care about it is because of its, quote, close proximity to Baghdad. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> what they're saying there, of course, is <laughs> ISIL is on Baghdad's doorstep, uh, but they're still trying to minimize the significance because, quite frankly, they don't know what to do. The president says no boots on the ground. And as we all acknowledge, I believe, uh, there have to be boots on the ground. The qu question is, whose boots? Who makes them? You know, Are they Turkish boots? I don't think so. And so whose boots are they going to be? So it's complete disarray in our policy toward that part of the world. The amateurs are in, in charge. And you know, if David Petraeus, the patron saint of all counterinsurgency, and trainer par excellence of the Iraqi army. <laughs> if he can't train them so that they don't run away as soon as somebody from ISIL shoots a AK-47 at them, if Petraeus can't do it, I see this jockerly, of course, nobody can do it. It's hardly Petraeus's fault. You can't train cousins to kill their cousins. It's as simple as that. And if we didn't leave that, learn that in Vietnam, you know, we're really, really dense. So, so much for uh, this amateurish business. I like to go a little broader now and talk about the Treaty of Westphalen, uh, which was mentioned earlier today, Helga. Uh, it's over, folks. That treaty is over. Um, now we have superpowers don't have to bother with treaties like that. As a matter of fact, that goes hand in hand with something even older. And that is something that we will be celebrating next year. I'll give you a hint. It's the 800th anniversary. What would that be? The Magna Carta, right. Somebody said it up front. So now, how are we going to celebrate the Magna Carta? We're going to say, oh, well, that was really neat when those uh, English noblemen faced up to, to King John and rested those rights. That was nice, but that was then. Um, and now we really have a funeral for, for the Magna Carta or an inquest or something that indicates that it's dead and gone, just like the Treaty of Westphalen. And, uh, you know, habeas corpus, <laughs> that, was a, that, was a quaint, that was a quaint idea. Uh, that's by the board now. We don't have to really uh, observe that or act by it. So things have become pretty bad. And the, the first lesson of learning or wisdom is to learn from mistakes and to learn from things that have gotten pretty bad. Now, I have to really suppress a laugh when I hear the president get up, our president, President Barack Obama, at the UN and say the three greatest threats to the world are Ebola, Russian aggression, and ISIL. 
Wow, Russian aggression. Uh, Putin made a, made a speech or gave an interview that just this week where he says, anybody who doesn't recognize that all the problems in Ukraine, the recent problems, stemmed from the putsch, stemmed from the coup d'etat on February 22nd, isn't living in the real world, you know? That's where it started. And what was mentioned before uh, with respect to Crimea, well, you know, I got asked on BBC, well, Mr. McGovern, uh, how do you feel about uh, uh, Putin seizing Crimea, uh, the aggression there? And I said, well, why are you asking me about the fourth inning? I beg your pardon? I said, well, why are you coming into the game in the middle? What do you mean? I said, well, it all started on February 22nd when there was a putsch, when there was a coup d'etat. And that's when it started. There is not one scintilla of evidence that Putin or any of his associates ever gave a thought to taking over Crimea until February 22nd, when it seemed to make good sense given the rot that came into power under the uh, supervision of Victoria Nuland, our Secretary of State for European Affairs, who used the F word. Some of you know the F word, okay? Uh, with respect to the EU. She said, F the EU. Uh, you know, uh, how did Angela Merkel, how did the other big shots of the EU react? Uh, there's no record that they said anything. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> when are the major countries or even the minor countries of the EU going to grow up? The war was over 70 years ago, folks. And we need you to grow up, we Americans. Why? Because we need you to help us understand what can happen when the Magna Carta <clears throat> Treaty of Westphalen and our own constitution is under siege. I do not exaggerate. Now, I was alive for World War II. I was pretty little, but I was alive for the whole thing. <clears throat> And I remember the post-war celebrations, and I remember how grateful Europeans were my first visit when I was in college. Well, now it's your turn. I'm not supposed to say the, this F word. <clears throat> this F word has a small F, and it's fascism. People identify fascism with concentration camps, and that's too bad because it's quite separate and distinct. Now, I'd like to show you a couple of videos, if they work, to show you uh, how fascism is impersonated, or personified, better word, by some of our leaders, uh, one of whom, the first one, uh, used to be head of NSA and then CIA for services rendered, and now he's a big talking head, as we say, on CNN, Fox News, he explains everything about what's going on. His name is Michael Hayden, kind of ironically the same name as the good Joseph Hayden with whom we started this morning. Can we have, whoops, I guess I just go like this, huh? My understanding is that the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution Okay, well, let, let me just uh, tell you what General Hayden says. Uh, he's, he's, up there, he's up there explaining why it was that they violated the Fourth Amendment which protects us all from uh, illegal searches and seizures. Whoops, I thought I heard it coming. And he's asked by Jonathan Landay, one of the real uh, wonderful reporters who saw through Iraq before Iraq and said that it was a, uh, a fool's errand and based on falsified intelligence. And somebody asked General Hayden, uh, why do you keep saying reasonable suspicion when the Fourth Amendment says um, that there has to be probable cause before you eavesdrop on Americans. And the answer he gives is, what? Well, the Fourth Amendment doesn't say probable cause. Now, those of you who know the Fourth Amendment know that probable cause is the basis for, uh, for our freedoms under the Fourth Amendment. And so he denies this without any, uh, without any recourse, and everybody just kinds of says, okay, and uh, guess what? It was at the National Press Club. So there were some, would you say, journalists there? Yeah, there were journalists there. And nobody put it in the paper the next day. That's how bad it is, folks. You want to try the second one? 
probable cause. Just, just one, Madam, Madam Chair, and I, I thank you. And this for you, Director Clapper, again on the surveillance front. And I hope we can do this in just a yes or no answer, because I know Senator Feinstein wants to move on. Last summer, the NSA director was at a conference, and he was asked a question about the NSA surveillance of Americans. He replied, and I quote here, the story that we have millions or hundreds of millions of dossiers on people is completely false. The reason I'm asking the question is having served on the committee now for a dozen years, I don't really know what a dossier is in this context. So what I wanted to see is if you could give me a yes or no answer to the question, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not. Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently perhaps uh, collect, but not, not wittingly. Thank you. I'll have additional questions to give you in writing on that point, but I thank you for the answer. Thank you very much, sir. Just, just one, Madam, Madam Chair, and I, I thank you. And My understanding is that the oh, we don't, we don't want the good general to uh, embarrass himself once again. Must have probable cause. Unless you want to see it again. Okay. Uh, the second one, the first one had, well, do you want to try this one now? See if this one works? This is Michael Hayden. Do you the Fourth Amendment actually... Uh, protects all of us against unreasonable search and seizure. But, That's the, what the, but the, says. the measure is probable cause, I believe. The amendment says unreasonable search and seizure. But does it not say probable? The, the, no. the, the, the court standard, the legal standard, search and seizure. the legal standard is probable cause. Just to be very clear, okay, and believe me, if there's any amendment to the Constitution that employees of the National Security Agency are familiar with, it's the fourth. Right. And, and it is a reasonable standard uh, in the Fourth Amendment. To quote the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States in its entirety, the one the General and the NSA folks are so familiar with and know is about reasonableness and not about probable cause, quote, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. No warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Well, maybe they have a different constitution over there at the NSA. <laughs> My understanding is that the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution... So they have their own constitution over there at NSA. Um, now, of course, uh, James Clapper, the head of national intelligence, was sacked as soon as he lied under oath, correct? No. Who's... This was a year and a half ago, March of last year. Who's the director of national intelligence now? Anybody know? Same guy, James Clapper. Who's the big talking head on CNN? Who's the man respected that you go to for answers on this? General Hayden. So what I'm saying here, folks, is that we have the foxes in charge of the chicken coop, and we have the president that is unwilling to stand up to his own security services and, in a way, to his own generals. Now, what does that mean for our internal situation? That means that our, the nervous breakdown that we had after 9-11 continues, and the American people, because of the terrible press, the terrible malnourishment that the American people get from the mainstream press, they don't really know what to believe. When they're told ISIL is, a, is a, a threat to our country, they tend to believe that because they're so afraid. You would think that after 12 years they wouldn't be so afraid, but they are. And, and people play on this. And people employ lawyers, distinguished lawyers, to write new rules or get people to make maneuvers around rules. A friend of mine, Todd Pierce, who's attorney, and was one of the, uh, well, actually still has a live Guantanamo defendant case. He was one of the few lawyers that actually got one of his detainees freed and back to Africa. He talks about uh, this. Under the Nazis, the law was used to demand absolute loyalty to the Führer and to the state. Now, anything less was considered treason. Ernst Flinkel, 
describe the system. Martial law provides the constitution of the Third Reich, the constitution. With martial law came surveillance necessary to detect enemies of the state. How many are you, uh, of you are uh, familiar with uh, a book that came out, uh, a diary uh, of, by a fellow named Riemann Pretzel? Hafner was his uh, pen name. He was a lawyer growing up in Berlin, 1933, and watched all the goings on. He was training to be a judge. And he would come to the office as all these uh, black shirts were wreaking their, their wares there. And he would say, um, aren't you disturbed about this? And they said, well, no, uh, the Reichstag had just burned down. And so we fully expect that our desks will be searched, our telephones will be tapped, and there will be infringements on our freedoms. Why do you have a Neues Deutschland there? Why are you reading, uh, why are you reading communist propaganda? And so the way Raymond Pretzel describes it, he says that, you know, uh, we, we Germans watched what was going on as if from a box at the theater. And I'm afraid that, that typifies the way most Americans look at what's going on in our own country because this martial law is what rules in our country now. Would you believe it? We'll believe it because it's true. Martial law. The legacy of our civil war to which the lawyers are going back now, are saying that the crimes under martial law that the US was under and is under now uh, are, quote, all acts of hostility to the country, to the government, to any department of officer that have the effect of opposing, embarrassing, defeating, or even interfering with our military or naval operations. Wow. So if you embarrass the government, you're liable to be put in Guantanamo. That sounds like a stretch, doesn't it? But under the law, somebody from Wiesbaden or Mannheim could come here from the US Army and pick me up now and put me in detention without trial, without charge, without jury. I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. That's legal now, OK? Now, what does that leave? That leaves an, a, an imperative on the part of the rest of us to do what we can to expose this first off so people know what's going on. And then, you know, we have to put our, our bodies into it. What I'm saying here is what Cesar Chavez, one of our big civil rights leaders, used to say, look, uh, op-eds are really great speeches, or even better, but without action, nothing's gonna happen. Now, what am I, what am I saying here? I'm saying here that you have some wonderful, wonderful examples to follow. Uh, first and foremost, I think of Sophie Scholl, and I see a lot of young people here, not quite as young as she was. She was 21, uh, almost 22, when she was arrested for nonviolent uh, opposition to the Nazi regime, the University of Munich. And do you know how they killed her? Anybody? Guillotine, something that the Germans learned from the French, I guess. Well, they got more civilized toward the end of the, of the war, and when Bonhoeffer was wrapped up, and others, uh, they had two other methods of killing. That was one shooting, and the other one was hanging. Now, the idea here is that, that Sophie recognized what was going on. She was guided by her conscience, and actually, she was a Lutheran. And uh, she was a very pious or devoted Lutheran. And I don't know if she read this, but this is something that Martin Luther wrote in one of his letters. It's very brief. And he talks, he's directing the to Christians, you know. But my, my idea is that uh, well, what I like to do is quote Kurt Vonnegut, one of our wonderful novelists. He was asked one time, well, what do you think of Jesus of Nazareth? And he said, well, I don't, I don't know if he was God or not, but, you know, if it weren't for the Sermon on the Mount, I think I'd just as soon be a cockroach. 
So people have told me, look, there are basic moral principles. People know what's right and what's wrong. Being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus who was tortured to death, that may be a special thing for you, McGovern, but we don't need that to understand what's wrong and what's right. Here's what Luther, uh, Martin Luther said. If I prof profess with the loudest voice every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at the moment attacking, I'm not confessing Christ, however boldly I may professing him. Where the battle rages, where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved, and to be steady on all other parts of the battlefield, but not where the battle rages, that is mere flight and disgrace if one flinches at that point. Sophie Scholl didn't flinch. And I was amazed to find out how little I knew about Sophie Scholl because I lived a block away from where she was held, Stadelheimer Gefängnis in München. And I, learned, I lived two blocks away from the Friedhof, the uh, graveyard where she's buried. And I knew nothing about her proximity to me in those days. I'm running out of time here, so let me uh, close here and uh, just say a few things about what I think we need to do. Um, when I was beaten up for simply standing with my back to Hillary Clinton, who was then the uh, Secretary of State, standing up quietly, not saying anything, not having anything, signs or, uh, I'd beaten up pretty badly. Um, my Veterans for Peace colleagues uh, sent out information to the press saying, uh, McGovern's 71 years old uh, and he's, uh, you know, he's been around a while, actually served in the government, he used to brief presidents and so forth like, well, the press didn't take much heed about briefing presidents, but what caught their eye was 71 years old. And guess what? I don't know how it is here in Europe, but in America, people don't like to see old people get beat up. <laughs> how do I know that? <laughs> Hillary Clinton received thousands and thousands of telephone calls and telegrams and emails say, why are you beating up an old man for? Fox News says an elderly man was escorted out of the room. Well, that was, that was hurtful, elderly man, but escorted out the room. Take a look and see how I was escorted out of the room. And so what I'm saying here is that old people like me, you have an advantage. I see maybe other people almost as old as I am. If you have some gray in your hair, put your body into it. People don't like old people to get beat up. Young people, I uh, have a comment to them, right? So put your body into it, use what you have. Now, you young people, you've got really good models here. You've got Sophie Scholl, 21, 22. You've got Bradley, now Chelsea Manning, who was 22 when he did his deed. You have Edward Snowden, who was 29. There is great hope. There is great hope that we can escape the, the rut that we're in because not only are young people more courageous these days, a small number of them at least, but they're highly technically proficient and governments cannot run without thousands of highly proficient young people. And that means that if just, there's just one Ed Snowden in a thousand, uh, people who are trying to run this world are in trouble deep. So if you have a conscience, make sure you speak out, make sure you you arrange things with a small group of, of sympathetic, sympathetic people where uh, you can decide on what to do and then hold one, one another responsible and accountable for going out and doing it. I'd like to show just the, these last two uh, film, these last two, uh, there are two images. Do I do that from here? I just want to show you uh, what we don't see, what we used to see from Vietnam, but when you have a country that has suffered a um, nervous breakdown and you send a poverty draft of, of soldiers there uh, without due reason, this is what happens.
we have the lights? This is an iconic picture. It's Talafar. It's early in the war. Uh, this little girl just, I was sitting in the back seat of her car. Her mother and father were killed immediately by American soldiers who uh, thought they were running a, a blockade. And uh, uh, that's the blood of her parents. She lost, I think, four other siblings. And not only was she brutalized here, but take a look at that, that, at that boot, that leg. Uh, what's happened to that young man, you know? And so the people we send off to these things are brutalized just as badly as the young girl there. She was six years old. She, she did survive. She was the only one of her family to survive. Now I want to just show you the next picture. Okay, now we all rejoice in uh, young children. These are uh, two two cousins who just had their little baby brother. That's what we should have in view for our country and for the world, not the first picture I showed. And so it behooves us all to remember, to bring these pictures into our consciousness and remember that just because people don't look like us, that doesn't mean they aren't fully human and don't deserve the same treatment that we would wish for our children. That's about all I'd like to say, but I thank you very much for your attention.